Such a great pleasure to be here, and I thoroughly enjoy my, uh, I guess, my uh, speaking engagement at Doctors for Disaster Preparedness. I'll say a few more words about DDP at the end of my talk, since we've been under attack as well from the UK Guardian. But uh, you probably was wondering, what was that all about? <clears throat> it appears to be extremely slow. But I would bet you that that is probably your, the fastest movie you've ever seen in your whole life. Because that's basically 15 billion years condensed into one minute. And here I'm trying to use the example of uh, gravity to try to explain what CO2 is not. And then the subject that actually I'm trying to tackle today, again, is completely new to me. I'm no expert in this subject. I'm not a marine biologist, but uh, some of you may have heard that... Uh, since CO2 global warming uh, idea has essentially sort of failed because, as you know, last 10 to 8 years or so, the atmospheric CO2 keep rising and then the temperature somehow just don't follow. It's clearly that it's not the greenhouse effect of CO2 that is causing the globe to cool, so therefore we must conclude that the CO2 has nothing to do with anything. And uh, so we're going to try to address this issue of the so-called evil twin of the carbon dioxide. As you know, they are running out of idea to scare children, so they're now trying to scare older people like ourselves. It's osteoporosis of the sea. And of course, I call CO2 a monster. is indeed a monster that somehow is so artificial that nothing seems to work in CO2's world. So without further ado, let me just move on. As you all know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, you know, all of the physicists and scientists and who, what have you essentially know that this is a greenhouse gas. Everybody agree on this, but they say that we're denying the greenhouse effect. And our favorite uh, saint, Saint El Gore, essentially say that, well, we know those things. It's so real. Come on. It's a principle in physics. It's not subject to any questions of debate. It's like gravity that exists. I only need to comment that, well, just the fact that gravity and uh, greenhouse effect exist doesn't mean that we understand them. In fact, understand them well enough to make sure to, to tell everybody that for the next 10, 20, 50, or 100 years that the world climate system is going to be dominated by CO2. That's for sure. All right, so Mr. Gore, I'm sure that you know that uh, CO2 and greenhouse effects are somehow related. There's no connection, sorry. So this is sort of uh, the kind of person who really don't understand what science is all about. And uh, our good colleagues, uh, Dick Linson of MIT, is fond of saying that this is the revenge of the, C the D students. <laughs> and now just to give you a still shot of what you have just seen. What we have seen is indeed a very incredible sort of uh, simulation of the collision between the Milky Way which has about a, a, a trillion star sun inside. And then Andromeda, which is 60% bigger, our neighbor, nearest neighbors are uh, big galaxies. And essentially showing you a simulation started about 5 billion years ago, where our solar system appears. And then fast forward to 10 billion years, to the bottom. Essentially, 
What I'm trying to convey to you is that gravity, although it looks simple, it is, it is indeed a very, very complex subject for physicists to conquer. It is a very, very complicated thing. Most of the thing, unfortunately, is really the things that you cannot see. It is that 80 to 90% of the dark matter that actually we're trying to figure out, right? But it is those kind of masses that is product, providing the dynamical friction that is telling you that in very, very short time, somewhat surprisingly, in the next 4 billion years, before even our sun can blow up, we may even have the opportunities in which that the two galaxies are going to merge together, all right? And then ultimately, by 10 billion years, there's no questions that something like that may happen. So this is just a summary plot to show you the relative distance between Milky Way and M31, which is Andromeda, right? They're separated by about 5 million light years or so. Remember, 5 million light years is really, really long distance. I mean, it takes the light to travel from one end A to B 5 million years. I mean, the distance from going from the sun, the light from the sun coming to the earth is 8 minutes, as you know. So everything we see about the sun is 8 minutes ago. So essentially, they will collapse and then essentially merge into one. You know, it's simple in this sense, the simulation. It's really nothing but taking two chocolate bar, right? One label Andromeda, one taking uh, Milky Way, and then prescribe the rule of Kepler, right? Kepler's law, and then just have a simulation, have a go at it. And then you get that. But although I'm not a native English speaker, I should endeavor to try to teach you a word today. Aren't you all a bit curious about what happened when you have this Milky Way and Andromeda kind of merge into one new galaxy? Anybody want to take a guess? What will you get? All right. All right. Okay, that's just a, a picture to show you roughly what would happen. Well, we're going to get Milkomeda. Remember, this word is really, really important for you to remember, but it's coined by my colleagues who actually simulated this, these things, of course. The reason why this is an important word is that because it's only a matter of another 100 billion years. Again, it's not a very long time because proton hasn't even decayed a bit. Proton will ultimately even decay. But it's only 100 billion years from now that most of the things that is moving away from us, this is the expansion of the universe, is essentially escape from our event horizon. That we ain't going to see them no more. That's it. The only thing left, there's no extra galactics study anymore. So the citizen of this Milky Way and Milkomida uh, uh, or Andromeda essentially have only Milkomida to remember. That's all we are. We're going to be very, very lonely somehow. They'll be sitting right here, unfortunately, with El Gore still around. <laughs> and then if this CO2 were to be that CO2 monster, to be that kind of powerful gas, I have to tell you that there is a 50-50% chance that in another 10, 4 to 12 billion years, we're going to get kicked out that far away. It's about 100 kiloparsecs, okay? Or basically 100 kiloparsecs. So that's about 100,000 uh, parsecs. So 330,000 uh, uh, light years away. And this is where our position is, right? We are, we are at about 8 kiloparsecs away from the center of uh, galaxies today. And then about... Five billion years ago, we are two kiloparsec inward, where we are subjected to a lot of this bombardment of cosmic rays and all this event where hostility of the early Earth was really sure, we are very sure about that. So those are another very interesting chronology to consider. Well, let me move on. I am really, really a non-mathematician, but I just sort of, uh, in memory, I just decided from now on that I'm just going to talk about good people. I'm just not going to ignore Mr. Gore from now on. That may be perhaps my last slide because I'm very frustrated of just only speaking of the evil. This is a, a very fine mathematician by the name of Vladimir Arno. I happen to be very, very lucky because although I'm a non-mathematician, but I happen to wrote a paper with a guy who wrote a paper with him. So my Arno number, he's Arno number zero. My friend's Arno number is number one. I'm number two. Ah, oh, that's really feel good. Anyway, I just want to set up our talk discussion today to try to pose a series of questions where, according to Professor Arnold, who tried to say that, it's only, that, a general, that it's a general principle that a stupid man can ask all kinds of questions like this in which a hundred wise men would not be able to answer. So we should take that spirit of being skeptical and, and being really mindful of what science and is and is not about and then try to go about answering some of these questions. Science is really a very, very beautiful 
uh, things that has been, I guess, come from, from God or nowhere, that essentially it gives us all that beautiful things in life that we really learn to appreciate. And I really think that we should stay in focus on that point rather than El Gore and so on and so forth. This is just for those who don't know Arnold. Of course, he has done a lot more beautiful things in mathematics. This is one of the magic that a mathematician can pull. It's called the Arnold Cat Map. Started from the original picture. It's essentially a 2D nonlinear stretching of the unit square, essentially, telling you that you can actually get back to even the same picture, or, but in between all of that, you get all confused about what it's all about. That's what chaos is all about, right? Ultimately, it's the same picture. It's just going through this uh, nonlinear transformation. It's actually a map of the 2D torus unto itself. Anyway, so in the spirit of Mr. Arno, we're going to start by asking, what does it even mean to acidify the ocean? This is actually not a very, very uh, unserious question because of the amount of exaggeration and I would say sickness that is going on in our society today. That is very, very troublesome. Let's start with what all this acid scale, how do we determine whether a, a, a liquid is uh, acidic or, or basis? Essentially, measured by this thing called, essentially you're measuring hydrogen ions, right? Protons, the concentration of it. More of it means you're more acidic Less of it means you are more basic. The scale is go from 0 to about 14, right? 7 is about neutral, rightly. And then I just make a point that rainwater is at about pH about 5.5. Uh-oh, if we are talking about acidification of the ocean. Does that mean it's illegal now for the rain to fall on the ocean? Does that mean it's illegal for me to even pour the water, which is basically neutral, and then pour it into the ocean? Because the ocean's pH is about 8.3, 8.2 or so. That's really something that we have to think seriously when these people started to say that we're going to acidify the ocean just because the carbon dioxide increased. And then, of course, only the bad thing can happen when you CO2 changes, right? So that's enough of the basic. I'm sure you all know about this, but, you know, orange juice, champagne, what have you, vinegars, I mean... We're not supposed to pour vinegar into the ocean too, so watch out. Now, I guess the scare is so bad that you even have to send uh, an expert, a very good guy by the name of Dr. John Everett. He's actually working for NOAA. Unfortunately, the leader in NOAA is extremely bad. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is a former NOAA person. I mean, he works actually in a management thing, but he's also a marine biologist. He said, with all this hype about acidification, many people are literally afraid of acid in the ocean. Ocean are not acidic, that's what he said. If all of the air entered the ocean, would still be alkaline, okay? It's just not possible to make it acidic. We just need to even assure the bather and the scuba divers that they will not dissolve. Watch out, man, when they say about this acidification, you will dissolve. And that the seafood is safe to eat, blah, blah, blah. The rainwater is even 100 times more than acidic than the ocean will ever be, right? I guess that's really essentially subject, summarize up the science, but we'll go into some details about this. Next, I want to show you a map of this surface water, how much the pH of the level is. As you can see, most of the world oceans is roughly on the level of about 8 or 8.1, 8.2 region, which means they are much more uh, basic than anything close to being acidic. But then I want to point to the region that is actually uh, purple and then blue, which is actually the most acidic region of the world. These are the region that is actually the most uh, marine biologically productive region of the world, okay? That all these upwelling processes that really created a lot of the condition around coastal region that you have a, a thriving marine system, actually ecosystem thriving around that region. And then I guess should we only also ban that, that sort of coastal upwelling region because it's acidic? I don't think so. This is now a transect map, okay? Essentially showing you the depth on the vertical axis and then the, the transect actually going from, uh, this is actually from the uh, tropic, subtropic to north. So essentially going from uh, code, uh, Oahu or Hawaii going all the way up vertically on the long same longitude, 152 or so west, all the way up to Kodiak. What I'm trying to point to is actually the very, very concentrated acidic region right around 1,000 meters or so, or even when you are near the, the, the Arctic subarctic water, the, the, the highly acidic region around 250 meters or so. I mean, think about it. 
these waters are essentially really acidic in that sense. Does that mean that if we, if we worry about this ocean surface uh, uh, water acidification, does that mean that we're going to prevent some of this water actually from outwelling too as well? How are we going to stop that? It's just a very, very insensible proposition to try to say that if you increase CO2, we're going to get all this ocean become acidic and then going to cause all the harms. Here's another problem. Now, it's just a scattered data trying to show you what the pH level is actually from 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south in the Pacific water, right? You can see it's all over the place. I mean, up here you can see 8.4, even as high as 8.5, and then down here is 7.8. And then roughly indicate for you on the right-hand side what the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide to be for equilibrium uh, pressure between the, the surface and the and, uh, surface water and the atmosphere. 320 all the way up to about 800 parts per million of the carbon dioxide. It's just all over the place. How could you even control this whole thing just because you increase carbon dioxide? I don't think so. Now let's get serious. There are some lawyers here, Andy is here, Andy Shafley. You can see that actually way back in terms of this uh, water, Clean Water X, there's a discussion that the EPA consider the water to be in a range, and of course they can recommend what the water pH should be from 6.5 to 8.5 for marine aquatic life, but no more than 0.2 pH unit outside the normal occurring range. This is really, really interesting because uh, folks have been trying to play with even things like this. The reason is, have a look. So you, get, you, you know that the water is actually between 6.5 to 8.5. According to EPA, we're still okay, right? But look at what they're trying to do here. This is actually now a computer simulation going from year 2000 to year 3000. Notice that they don't want to study to 2100 already. That's no longer good for them. The reason why I guess the 100 year simulation is not good is, and of course plotted is the pH value of the water across the, the, the ocean uh, level, right? From sea level all the way to about four or five kilometers uh, under the ocean. The reason why is that because when they predict 100 years into the future, the changes is no more than 0 0.1 units, right? So. You can have EPA to do anything because it's not illegal. I guess you have to push all the way out to a, a thousand years to try to see some effects so that they can start doing something about this. This is another one of those things that is very, very troublesome about how science is continually being assaulted by that, by this kind of manipulation and this kind of misrepresentation of what it is about. And of course, the simulation, the, the biochemistry in this is almost laughable in, in that sense. I'll explain in a minute. Here's one of the ways to look at this. Just remember one of this. They told you that as you increase this CO2, you're going to make the ocean water more acidic, right? And then you're supposed to dissolve this carbonate system so that all these corals and all these other systems that have uh, uh, carb carbonate, which is chalk, right? As a shell will not survive and then it essentially it will cause all this ecological interrelation disaster, right? But what they did in their simulation is that they make the assumption that, you know, you're not supposed to even dissolve the carbon dioxide, but they want to tell you that, you know, this whole thing. That's basically their assumption, which is the bottom curve. As you increase CO2 from about 200 ppm to about 800 or so. And then the real actual value, although the changes is very small, is that, but the correct calculation is that you have to at least rely on the upper curve, okay? So it's that kind of internal inconsistency that is also very problematic to me. Although, it's, you know, the changes is very small in the first place. Of course, and then ocean water is essentially not really only controlled by carbon dioxide. That's the point. Now, I just want to give you some example of all these naturally acidic waters in the hydrosphere of the Earth. Water everywhere, right? Water is always acidic. Here is one of the example lakes from New Hampshire. I mean, the lake water CO2 is extremely high, as you can see, and then the, the air CO2 is roughly about three to 400 ppm or so. Oh, I guess the lake water is acidic now, right? It's extremely high. Here is just uh, another data, basically now plotted as a function of time, pH value from about 7.6 or so, very acidic, all the way up to 8.2 or 8.3. This is now uh, based on uh, coral reef measurements from uh, northeast of Australia. You can see the value just fluctuate up and down. And of course, please remember, as Fred will tell you very well, from 800 to maybe 1950 or so, there's clearly no SUV around, so I guess all this fluctuating has nothing to do with uh, human or Martians. Here's another data from, uh, again, this is also in, uh, in Aust Australian region. 
the Flinder Reef, Western Coral Seas, the value again fluctuate up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay? It's really a readjustment of nutrients and all these other minerals in the system that really is, I would say, far more important, even though I'm not a marine biologist or biochemist of any kind. And then here is one example that has longer history, way back to about 7,000 years or so in South China Sea. That you can reconstruct this from doing all kinds of geochemistry measurements of uh, sediments that is, uh, can be pulled out from all this uh, under the sea. Again, the value is going up and down, up and down, up and down. I just couldn't make myself to believe that this, this uh, CO2 level going up and down by a few units will cause all the problem. Right? And finally, there's also always, they are always talking about the, the danger of uh, basically, you know, we have already documented geological disaster in the past. Here, let's talk about the 40 million years ago, right? They say that there are strong evidence, evidence of acidification of the oceans 40 million years ago. And then, just to show you where the continent are, 40 million years ago, we're still not really in the proper uh, uh, position where we are today. And then those numbers are just showing you where the cores are that I'm going to show you some of the results. But 40 million years ago, apparently, that we can only find evidence for acidification, which means you see reduced calcium carbonate, right? Carbonate accumulation is a lot less. Only for things that is actually the sediment at really the top, only like below 3,000 meters. At the top of it, if it's slightly higher, you can't even find an evidence for it. So I guess you have to figure out where those uh, acidification come from. At the top here, we're showing you the, Atlant uh, the Atlantic basins. It's plotted basically relative to about 40 million years ago at the center, going from about uh, the past 42.5 million years ago to 38 million years ago towards the future, right? And then the top here is Atlantic Oceans. The red curve there that I point is basically from a site that is above, uh, it's at 2,000 meters. And then the blue curve there is at 3,400 meters. You clearly can see that the carbonate accumulation has reduced around there, right? But only below 3,000 meters. Same data from Indian Oceans. You can see only evidence for, for the one at 2,200 meters. There's no change. And then the bottom one actually kind of shifted around 40 million years ago. And then finally, the Pacific Ocean. You can see very high concentration of carbonate, you know, in the past for the very, very deep sites at 3,300 3, or so. And then when it comes to 1,950 meters, there's no change. So the conclusion here is that even how, how do you even get actually atmospheric deposition of CO2 to cause all these major effects? Most of the effects really come from something tectonic, something below the oceans that is really, really would be far more interesting at those forces. And I don't think it's any interesting test at all or even analogy to apply to the modern carbon dioxide issues. Now, let's get to the phrase osteoporosis of the sea. Where does it come from? It actually came from a testimony given by Dr. Jane Lubchenko, which is very well known to my colleagues here, uh, uh, Juan Ramirez from, uh, from uh, Tampa. Jane Lubchenko, as most of you may not know, is also from Oregon State, distinguished professor of marine biology, by the way or ecologies of some kind, but now she become the, the chief of NOAA, which is the National uh, Oceanic uh, Administration, Atmospheric and Administration, right? She gave a testimony around December of 2009 or so. Here's what she said. So she asked the question, who then in the ocean is affected by... By the way, her testimony is really worth watching just to see how, you know, Simple science can be so twisted and distorted to the point beyond redemption, really. That's a lot of problem in that testimony, by the way. It's constituted to the point that it's scientific lies. You can call it human lies, but to me, that's all kinds of lies there. Or, or even pure ignorance and pure manipulation of people because she's showing how you can drop a chalk in there and then you know, things will become more acidic, the water changes color. That's the way they demonstrate this thing. And so she asks, who then in the ocean will be affected by this ocean acidification? or osteoporosis of the sea? Well, she's answered, any plants or animal that have a shelf or skeleton made of calcium carbonate, the hard part of many familiar animals such as oyster, clam, corals, lobster, crabs, are made of calcium carbonate. All right. You know, as a scientist, guess what we do? We will only ask the question, if Dr. Lutenko says so, let's just test for it. Let me start with lobster and uh, crab where I highlighted that. 
We'll talk also about oyster and clam in a minute. But I like lobster and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and crabs. Here is now, by the way, a result. This result actually came out December 1st, 2009 in a journal called Geology. She must have known about this result. I am absolutely sure because this result has been reported about six months back in a meeting, a professional meeting of, uh, of geoscientists many months back, at least. And this is one of the lobster looking at, uh, you know, growing at about 400 ppm. And then another one in the experiment, you grow at seven times higher or 2,850 parts per million or so. That's what happened to the lobster. Is it or is it not going to dissolve? This is really high, by the way. You can burn all you want in all your carbon. You might not even get this, right? Let's push it to the limit. Why not? Let's study it. Science is, a, is really a, a matter of testing. It's not about all this chit-chat and all this emotion or osteoporosis of the sea. Whoa. The lobster grow bigger. I have another problem with her statement in a minute. Now for, for crab, blue crab. 400 ppm. My God, the crab grow too. But you know, you know what's the real serious problem even in her phrase? She said calcium carbonate, right? Remember a marine biologist telling people, average people, that saying that these shells are made from calcium carbonate? Not really, you know, lobster. I'm not a real marine biologist. I know that the shelf material of crab and, and lobster is essentially very high concentration of magnesium calcite, right? It's made of cheaton materials. And this guy is selling all kinds of junk to people to try to say, you know, it's not really calcium carbonate per se, really. Okay, so that's even coming from an administrator, a professor, a distinguished professor, or so on and so forth, and saying all this kind of thing. It's just to create scare to people. Now let's ask the question of uh, clams and oyster because their shell are indeed made from calcium carbonate. Let's see how bad it's going to be, right? Let's start with the clams. Here's a clam for the same condition, 400 parts per million at the top, and then very, very high concentration, seven times more than the top, roughly. Well, you can see there's a lot of features on the top one, and then the bottom one is kind of smoothed out. It's really true. No doubt about it. If you make the, the water a lot more acidic, I mean, you are going to have some effects. But not all effects are going to be bad. That's the whole point, right? But also for clam in the sense that, I mean, is the clam really going to die off? That we're not even sure of. How can we be sure of that, right? But the point is to tell you that this is really also a very extreme condition, right? Now let me go to the oyster situation, which is much more interesting in terms of the amount of manipulation involved. Maybe clam is still a very not interesting species for these folks. Here's a story about oyster. In there, scaring away, I mean, they, they really run out of game. So they, this is another one that is very, very interesting. They're talking about oyster larvae off from Oregon coast, okay, where our future congressman is going to be. But here's a testimony from someone by the name of Donald A. Water, commercial fisherman from Pensacola, Florida, okay, testified in April of 2010. Okay. Why would you need a fisherman from Pensacola to come and testify about some oyster larvae in uh, Oregon? Can't you just get the guy from the Oregon to come and speak? Ain't that funny all by itself? Well, just see what he, what he say, what Mr. Mr. Donald Waters says. Remember, this is under oath, you know. Somehow we should hold these people accountable. Mr. Waters is saying one of the shellfish growers that he met, right, was Mark Wein uh, Wilgart from Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery in Netats, Oregon. Three or four years ago, for no apparent reason, according to them. No apparent reason. Okay, good. Maybe not CO2. The oyster larvae that Mark grew for a living started dying in the first few days of their life. The usual culprit, like marine bacterial infection, turns out to be innocent. That's what he said. After a few years of major larvae die off, barely staying in business, scientists working with Mark and his partner correlated the die off with upwelling of deep water. Remember I told you? Hey? It's the deep water. We're going to stop preventing water from coming up, actually. <laughs> By high concentration of CO2. For juvenile oyster, the water was so corrosive. Remember the keywords, right? It's going to grow up. Larvae simply could not survive it. You know, when I saw this, I don't even have to do anything. I was already, man, that's not right. That's just not right. How can you get a fisherman from uh, Pensacola and come and talk about Oregon, you know? It's just funny. Why don't we hear it from uh, those guys themselves, Mr. Mark and then his wife? This is already known way back. The oysters are killed by the bacteria, okay? 
Here is one of the story that come out in the newspaper that I was able to find of the Google. Thank God for Google, right? I mean, this guy says that essentially last summer the bacteria multiplied to the level that shut down this hatchery at the at the bay, right? The tiny oyster larvae that was able to swim busily under a microscope instead looked sunken and feeble, as a toxic enzyme secreted by the bacteria destroyed them. Says Sue Cut, which is the wife of this uh, fisherman. And then they work with the scientists, of course. Clearly, they work with the scientists, but guess what they do? Right? They work with this scientist from the Hatfield Marine Center. Well, they already found those previous cases in 2005, so on and so forth, but they de developed a new filtration system that filtered out all this stuff. And then, of course, shine ultraviolet light, so essentially that the bacteria could be removed from the water for entering the hatchery. See? It's not CO2. It's clearly not CO2. So, again, all this problem. Now, let's explain this. Because science, we have the role to not only, you know, reject hypotheses, we only need to kind of explain what kind of this statement that is coming from those people. After all, they are supposed to be some sort of scientists, right? I want to show you now the picture that is very often shown. And this one, I just picked the example from the November 2007 of National Geographic, showing you the shell of a this is one of those shells that is uh, going at day, day, day 0, day 16, day 26, day 45. Here, I couldn't find how high the acidic level is, but it's fairly high, okay, according to me. And I want to make a point that also Dan, Dr. Jane Luchenko, during the testimony, also showed this video, okay, this live video, and showing that. So how can we explain this dying shell? Anybody want to guess? Is this really having to do with CO2? Right. That, uh, yeah, one way is that maybe it's extremely acidic, which is, doesn't exist, I guess, in any possible real-world condition. But worse, actually, worse. Here's the answer. Here's the answer from one of the person, a young postdoc by the name of Deborah Iglesias Rodriguez from University of Southampton. She actually performed a study that found that as you grow, actually, certain phytoplankton, in fact, the major species in the North Atlantic, okay, one of those cocoa little spores, that actually was growing, if you grow them under high, higher CO2 concentration, but this time, instead of doing a trick like this, which actually, instead of changing the, the pH of the ocean by letting the CO2 bubbling through the system participate in the carbonate and bicarbonate uh, cycles and then sort of manifest itself, this folk actually add through weak hydrochloric uh, acid into the system just to change the pH level. This is actually a trick that is just shameful. If one is not enough, let's take another one. This is the person, Alina, uh, someone who actually, during this, this, uh, this uh, interview, also openly stated that she voted for Obama. So she said that they found fault because of using hydrochloric acid. Instead of letting the carbon dioxide bubble through, they don't even want to wait for the system to settle down. They trick those experiments by, by, by showing things like this, right? They just put hydrochloric acid into the system. Of course it's going to dissolve. What kind of study is this? And these are literally serious stuff. I mean, these are the folks who is actually promoting this thing right now. Royal Society, oh, by the way, Royal Society, has actually put up a lot of money to try to make this a focus of ocean acidification. Okay? This is all the science, the science turning non-science, of course. But seriously, though, why are some of the animals able to sort of uh, thrive instead of harm when you, when you kind of change the pH level actually towards more acidic condition or less alkaline, right? which is the proper way to say it. It turns out that I, the way I read it, again, I'm a non-expert, I'm a non-marine -bio biologist, and please, I do not want to become a marine biologist. Some of you may have heard that I talk about polar bear once, and I really do not want to be a polar bear expert. So this is just the way that I understand it, and I've been reading a lot of literature. Uh, it's quite true, Art. I do read a lot of stuff just to learn a little bit. And uh, here's one of the best, few of the three answers. One of them is actually, Essentially, some of the organism apparently able to sort of use the bicarbonate itself rather than the carbonate. This is the example that is shown by the, the, the young postdoc that I mentioned to you. By the way, she was a young postdoc. She also kind of shut up a little bit now. When she published this paper, immediately she really got criticized by a lot of her colleagues. Okay? She's a young postdoc. Okay? Now, the second one is basically when you have more carbon dioxide into the system and then entering the, the, the ocean uh, water, Clearly, you're going to have more dissolved in organic carbon. So there are also apparently some species of organisms that are able to use more of this uh, dissolved uh, inorganic carbon by itself. 
But the more interesting one to me is that because it exists in the literature for a long time already, actually. I would say since the 60s and 70s, but they can do more proper experimentation in the 2000s or so, where apparently for a lot of this machine, uh, this uh, organism at their calcification site, they are actually uh, very, very active. There's a lot of fast processes that are able to steal the, the protons. There are all kinds of processes, you know, all biological processes. Uh, photosynthesis, one of them. We grabbed all of this so that it makes all the pH water around those calcification sites a whole lot lower, okay? A lot, a lot, whole lot higher pH, higher, but so it's less acidic, okay? Up to even two units. Here we're talking about changes of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Here about the two units. Apparently, this system have that kind of protective marine layers, right? Uh, organism that around the area that they're not being harmed by. And this is one of the examples that I was able to find. Plotted here is actually, you see, plotted is the distance from the surface of this, this calcification site from about measure in micron unit, micrometer, right? 10 to the minus 6 meter, very, very tiny region, but from about 1,000 micron to near the surface. And just focus on the one that I plotted, red line, which is, which is actually showing you the pH level measure, uh, those things, very fine measurement. They put the tiny crop in it, microbe in it, from about 8 to about 9, right? You can see, so it's more less acidic when you increase the value of this pH. So for the square block, you can see going from very far away from the site, it's actually go up when you are under photosynthesis. So it's really true, you can verify all of this. And there are a lot more examples like this, of course. And then another way to see this is basically this experiment, the same experiment by, done by these authors from Holland. They are able to show again when you switch on the light, switch off the light, it's very, very immediately responds to it. It shows you that biology dominates, really. So this marine chemistry stuff is really, really also highly misleading in a lot of sense if you don't talk about biology. I mean, Freeman Dyson, the, the great physicist from Princeton, is very fond of criticizing the climate model. He said, maybe, maybe they got the, the physical aspect of the, of the problem correct. Not really, of course, because you know they're, they're boiled down by the problem of dealing with uh, uh, chaos or, or nonlinear fluid dynamics. But they don't have the biology right. That's the statement from Freeman Dyson. Essentially, I would try to say that, you know, the pH actually get less acidic if you turn on the light because all these fast processes is able to steal the hydrogen ion. So you make your water alkaline or less acidic. So that's basically the answer. And then just to give you another survey of my quick reading, there's a new paper that just came out that tells you that even depends on whether you have flow in certain region that you could enhance the photosynthesis or you don't have flow. If you have flow, you kind of enhance the photosynthesis, so therefore you sort of make the calcification process of the thing so that the stuff will take away the proton, so you make the, the thing less acidic in that sense, so it will be less so the authors say that given the positive relation between photosynthesis and calcification in coral, exposure to flow may locally reduce actually the predicted deterioration of coral reef due to ocean acidification. These people are still buying into this, of course, they are in the bandwagon of agreeing with everything, but the basic study that they do, I think, is important in that sense, to try to introduce another variables in the ocean water to, to consider when you want to talk about you know, this marine system response to acidification processes. And with this quote, I just want to sort of summarize that I would say that there are indeed empirical evidence to suggest that as the water becomes more acidic, there's higher biological productivity and denser amount of life, actually. So in other words, acidic seas are essentially not totally a bad thing. It can be a really a very good thing because we already have plenty of evidence that in all these upwelling regions, they are highly acidic because of indeed the water brought, brought up from the from the bottom that is acidic that has not seen sunlight for a while. Now, towards the end of my talk here, I'm going to try to tell you about the CO2 monster. Essentially, it's a bit, a bit of my con uh, confession because I know that I've been talking here straight for 11 years and I've been really having assembled all my energy to try to show you some of the more definitive proof of how to kill the CO2 monster. So uh, I've been asking myself lately, where is it? How do you find this thing? How do we be more convincing in terms of talking about science about CO2 greenhouse effect? So essentially, it's everyone's idea, but it's the whole idea then, why don't we look in the spectral region where the CO2, according to the quantum mechanics of the, of the system, that it has to be at that particular place. So can we see or not see it or not, the greenhouse effect, and how does it affect the temperature system or the climate system? 
before we even do that, I want to remind ourselves how crazy the whole notion of this uh, greenhouse effect or this consideration of just radiation flow in the climate system has been. Essentially, I want to summarize for you that CO2 is not a heat source. Even as our 12th sec Secretary of Energy, Steve Chu, is fond of saying that you can melt the Greenland ice sheets, right? Just ask him, how do you precisely melt these ice sheets if you shine this infrared radiation? It's not possible, really. If you shine a visible sunlight, it's a completely different business. So the bottom line here is that CO2 is not a heat source nor a heat sink. The only thing you do when you increase or change CO2 concentration is that you change the rate of how the Earth cools itself. That is completely different from saying that you have a heat source or a heat thing to warm the thing. You just change the rate of how it cools. Some of the bottom line that I collected here is really, I think, is useful and should be a, a, a very, this is a very careful summary statement, of course, based on essentially many people's ideas, but one of the major person's idea here is Professor Dick Linson, who has said this for almost like 20 years uh, at least. Essentially, that if you think about it, in the absence of greenhouse gases, no CO2, no water molecules, the Earth average temperature will be only minus 1C. By the way, it's not minus 18 according to most people. And I leave it as an exercise for you guys to figure out why it's minus 1C. But if you consider this Gardekan experiment that you can do in thoughts, but you can get the real answer in a very reasonable way, what if you have the greenhouse gas and then you have the given sun radiation input energy to the system and then you allow only the earth to cool by radiation, okay? What will you get? You will get an overheated earth at about 70 to 80 degrees or so, Celsius. That is really hot. What does that tell you? It tells you that uh, the way the system cools itself by radiation is highly ineffective process. According to Linzen, but of course, we know Earth is at 15 degrees Celsius. That shows you that this radiative process is really not a very major player at all in terms of governing the heat flow or, or, or energy ba balancing or disbalancing in the system. It's really that the system has found a much more efficient way to cool itself off its surface through air currents, storm system, large-scale circulation, eddy, so on and so forth. These are the stuff that you really need to know. And then, of course, the most misleading thing about greenhouse effect is that if you really want to study the greenhouse effect of CO2, you really don't have to study CO2. You study the effects from water vapor. That's it. And cloud and all this system. You cannot separate those effects. This is why they have created this. They win the war of the language, by the way. They, they just make sure you focus on the word forcing and the feedback, and then that's it. You're completely paralyzed if you're trapped into that business. If you don't think, it, think of it as a dynamical evolution of the system, then you lose. Okay? So now let's just give you an example of what I mean when you have uh, Here's actually, again, spectrum, right? Measure in wave number units from about 600 okay, to 2000, 2000 or so. Okay? It's basically more towards the visible over there. This is more towards infrared here, showing you the radiance. This is for a dry winter condition, showing you all kinds of features. You can also see some of the CO2 feature there, right? You have CCFC, you can see all kinds of things, CH4. This is for a dry winter where you don't have much water vapor in North, uh, Ontario, Canada. Look what happened when you have a moist summer. Anybody, can you tell me where is the CO2? How CO2 is going to be important? Nothing, absolutely. Notice that your unit changed a lot in terms of the radiance unit. That is minus six, right? Really, really tiny amount. This is at least factor of 100 or 10 more. When you have more of this, everything is water vapor. There's nothing to talk about, really. Okay, so where is it, right? And uh, so this is, I guess, the idea is that people thought that, oh, we already know this greenhouse effect, right? According to Gore, it exists. So we must know this very well already. But I want to point your attention to the main CO2 feature right at that feature there, okay? The one that's spiking up at about 600 to 800 or so. That is actually the well-known feature at roughly about 666 uh, wave number unit. No wonder, right? CO2 is the satanic gas. I mean, so the whole idea now is that can we find any measurement around that region to try to see whether we have or not these things? Why not? Let's go do it. Because if it's true, we really got to say it's true. There is just no if or but about this. That's the problem that I've been having with this discussion here. They act like everybody else is so stupid and do not want to learn the truth. You know? Well, you know that what they are about. They are all about politics. So let's look at this. 
just allow me, it's a complicated chart, but here is basically the red dotted curve is AIRS. That's actually stand for atmospheric infrared sounders that's flown on the Aqua satellite, the NASA satellite in 2002. So they've been measuring uh, radiance, and then you can convert into temperature unit, brightness temperature, okay, plotted in that unit. It's basically going from the feature where you can find the 666 feature all the way towards more infrared region, right, to the right. And then plotted in the dotted curve is what the model can produce, okay. And then the top one is for clear sky condition. By the way, clear sky never really exists in the, in the Earth atmosphere. All sky, this is meaning sky that have clouds as well. But you know, overall, you can say, what is this Willison talking about, man? Those guys are really good. They can calculate the blue curve and then, and then it kind of fit what is being measured really well, isn't it? Something wrong with what I say here. But let's look in details. Because remember, when you look at those things before, it was measuring the things from about 220 to about 380 degrees Celsius in the region. It spread out so far that you couldn't even see the difference between the calculation and the measurements. This is actually what's being shown by one of the student PhD thesis. This is during his thesis defense. I contacted him and then he showed me this data. And what is being shown here is, of course, the, the difference between the measurements and the calculation, right? And you can see now, the reason why it looks almost agree is that because you have overestimation on this more infrared region from about, you know, now, now they basically plot from about 800 to about 1,200 or so, and then underestimation on this side where it's dominated by the water band. Okay, this is basically called the, the window region in which there's nothing to impede this radiation, so this stuff will go away. I look at this graph, actually, I was puzzled. Those guys were trying to talk about CO2 somehow, but they kind of don't show the other side. How come? So now I, I found that indeed that there were some calculations. There were data that showing, look at that, that the, the difference between that around the CO2 feature is a lot more bigger. That's really five, 10 kind of a units rather than the small one on the right hand side. They essentially cut off those things during a PhD defense of Princeton University. You're talking about corruption or what, right? That you're not even there to tell the whole thing and show the whole thing. I mean, would a committee allow such a thing? I don't think it's right to even do that, you know, during a PhD thesis defense talk. Essentially, I'm just saying, look, it's politics all over again. And then the reason why you see agreement is that, right? And you really cannot see it, actually. I, I have another data that I sort of say that is too much data already, that if you look around, you really are not able to find anything to confirm that. Although, of course, there's one published paper that says that they already found it, but I can tell you the whole of that paper in a minute, if, if you really want. But I want to almost end with this kind of stuff that I see that I may have shown this one time before, so allow me to repeat after 11, uh, 10 or 15, 10 or uh, 5 years or so, that there's somebody actually published this paper, okay, in, in current science and then medical hypothesis that say we should be very worried. Because ultimately, when you increase this CO2, it's not only get the global warming, not only going to make the ocean more acidic, you might even kill people. So you are the doctors here, and they say that it's been predicted that by 2050 AD that the CO2 level will reach 750, 720, and then the blood pH of all humans would then be in the region where acidosis would occur, where every human on earth will suffer from acidosis all of their lifetime. And then, of course, grandchildren or children born after 2050 will begin to show the effect of acidosis from birth. And then in consequence of these changes, a very large number of people are likely to die at an early age. Should we be worried about that? Should we have nothing better to do than worry about things like this? I just give you a hint. I don't know how to defend this kind of insensical thing, but I just attempt to say to tell you that just remember that every time you respire, you're actually putting out a whole lot more carbon dioxide than anything. Your biological system is clearly able to cope with this. And then I want to have an illustration about, I say, forget about this biochemistry. I really don't know also biochemistry, by the way. Let's just ex examine the role or actually the, the effect of CO2 in champagne and Coca-Cola, right? Let's have a small celebration before we end. Let's start with champagne. Chill at about 4 degrees Celsius, just about right for my taste. With CO2, you can see the pH level is measured at 2.91. You know, and what happens if we have degassed? It go up. It becomes actually less acidic. 
So that's kind of true. If you add more CO2, you make it more acidic. You know, the change is kind of small, right? Not that big, 2.96 degrees. Now, what surprised me the most is that when I look up the literature, here's the information on Coca-Cola. Here's one with a CO2, a lot of gas in it. I really like Coca-Cola with gas, of course. I don't like to drink wine without gas. But it turns out that it's bad for you because it's more acidic when you have no gas in it. Okay? These counterintuitive results, I guess, the only way to explain this is that because the pH in the cola is really largely controlled by the food-grade phosphoric acid rather than the, the bubbling of the CO2. The CO2 gives you the effects, of course, which is one of those surprising things for me also. Of course, you've got to do the experiment properly. And I was at Chicago Heartland uh, uh, Institute, uh, Great Heartland Institute uh, meeting, and then I was just obligated. I thought this chart is also interesting for this audience here. And here we have a really, really a very supposedly very, very smart guy. He's a condensed matter theorist from University of Chicago. His name is Leo Karanov, really, really a brilliant scientist, physicist. But then when he started to say things like this, I becoming really also scratching my head all over again. And then that's why I want to go back to the team of uh, Vladimir Arnold. He said, imagine that over a period of two years, Lake Michigan could rose by 100 meters over two years, okay? Remember, this, if, you, if you think about it, right, this is in uh, 2010 now, in 2012, right? The, the, the prophecy coming from the, the Aztec calendar. It would come out to the 30th floor of the story of Sears Tower covering most of Illinois with sea water, salt water. Of course, he said, exactly this kind of thing cannot happen here and now. But other things can, he said. Maybe the worries about global warming have a point. And my, I'm really stunned and puzzled by such kind of statement. My, my question is, Exactly, what is the point that you are trying to make here? Okay? And I say, forget about Sears Tower, man. The killer CO2 politics is here now. And the thing that we got to do as an average citizen, oh my God, I forgot to make the disclaimer. I can only speak on my own behalf, you know, on my own self in this universe, not even my whole family. Really, I can speak only on behalf of my own self. And I don't speak on behalf of any institution that I work with. I'm under also a lot of pressure from Greenpeace, as you can see. <laughs> and I would say, let's save Washington, D.C. from the Chicago Mafia first. <laughs> and we wish uh, Art Robinson very, very good luck. <laughs> Although I'm very long-winded, I do have one more or two more slides to say. This is where I'm going to really end now. But I have one more. As you all know, June 4th, about last week or so, UK Guardian decided that they have to pay attention to us. We are now world famous, guys. Doctor for Disaster Preparedness, you guys are meeting here, all these conspirators, and all kinds of stories, and then they even try to give advice to our modern Alfred P. Newman, which is, of course, AKA Professor Fred Singer. What worry? <laughs> he said that he suspects that Singer and Soon would be taken more seriously by the wider world, the wider world if we don't you know, taint ourselves by association with this obscure political outfit such as Doctor for Disaster Preparedness. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I mean, my personal opinion, I, I humbly really want to thank Jeremy and Jane and Art and Robinson for actually training me, allowing me to speak this forum for straight 11 years. I don't know how to speak. I barely even have English in my head. But the thing about Doctor for Disaster Preparedness that I must say something that's very clear is that they care about people and they love America. Those two things are good enough for me, for one really soon. I'm quite sure the same for Fred Singer. And I really, you know, how dare are they to tell me things like this, of course. For that, I want to contrast with this world-famous organization called IPCC. Let's compare DDP and IPCC. How, how does that go? That will be a battle. We are small, but we are powerful, I tell you, because we are independent-minded people. This is one of the most puzzling things and one of those political-oriented results coming from IPCC that I never know how to answer for the longest time until I, I learned something from a friend of mine. So they talk about objectivity from IPCC report, right? And then one of the questions that arrived in one of this blog that I saw from one of my friend's place, his name is Matt Brick. He's a statistician from Cornell. And uh, one of the guys asked, can someone please explain to me how IPCC can put a numeric probability to the statement that there is 90% or they say, quote, very rightly, chance that global warming by man-made CO2 emission is true. Here's one of the guys that uh, answered this thing in one of the blocks. The answer say, let's see. 
Maybe we have 10 skeptics, 10, 10 experts in the room. Six of them are skeptics and they say, wow, well, maybe 50 50. All right? But out of that six, you got four actually say that they're 100%, 150% sure. <laughs> I guess they're right because, you know, six of them say 50 50, so six times 0 0.5, you get 0 0.3. The four of them that have 150% sure is four times 1.5, so you got 0.6, so you got 90% certainty. <laughs> that goes about the scientific objectivity about IPCC. And I can tell you I'm very, very proud to be associated with a doctor for disaster preparedness. With that, I'll stop. If I have time, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. The schedule here, the, the schedule here calls for a 15-minute break, but Willie hasn't had a chance to answer questions, so maybe we, might, we should do both at the same time. If you need to go to the bathroom or something, go ahead, but let him answer questions during the break because we don't have a, a, a special time for your talk. Is that okay? Okay, fine. Sorry, I talked for too long today again. <laughs> no, 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 no. I use up one hour. Thank you for a most engaging presentation. I also have a disclaimer to say that I, I am not a marine biologist. But as, as an emergency physician, I've presented uh, on the subject of marine toxins and aquatic hazards. And it led me on a, a review and curiosity of, of the literature uh, in terms of what you have what you've presented today. And I, I can certainly validate uh, what I've found uh, in, my, in my research and in, in uh, publishing on, on this subject. Um, what, what that... Uh, says is that the imperative is that we have scientists in Congress who can actually rebut a lot of the junk science and how important it is that we elect people to Congress who will be able to to seek the truth and, and bring it to light. Uh, what I've found is that the concept of black smokers, these volcanic vents that exist on the ocean floor, which have not been studied very well, yes. are, can you comment on that? Because not only the bacterial microorganisms uh, that exist uh, on the ocean floor, but also the, the temperatures that are driven from the ocean floor that have no effect from convection in the atmosphere because they're so deep under the ocean Indeed. are actually what can drive ocean temperatures and and the uh, chemical environment at, at, on the ocean floor could you comment on that in your in in your review of the literature it will be very brief so the question is about all this vent that is under the beneath the oceans right i i have done a lot of reading too on that subject a little bit uh when I was doing that, I was mainly interested in about mercury. Where does it come from? How does it get recycled and all that? I mean, it turns out to be a very significant source of all this stuff that you think that you see. is all these atmospheric processes that they're talking about. I mean, clearly that the oceans is very, very underexplored. I mean, we really don't know anything about it. I am quite sure that this ocean underwater water volcanoes will create all sorts of conditions. But it's really interesting. There might be certain dynamics, of course that doesn't prevent some of this result to be known kind of in the upper surface region, is true. That I felt there's still some interesting thing to study about that. And then also the relationship with photosynthesis and sunlight will be more, really intriguing for myself to, to learn a little bit more. But I really couldn't say anything beyond that, that I, you know, all these little things that I know. We can talk more, of course, on the side. Thank you for your questions. And thank you for you know, being independent and trying to confirm all these things. I mean, I couldn't possibly make this up, man. This is a joke, you know? I have three comments uh, that are relevant to your talk. I can explain why Jane Lubchenco and so many of her ilk are making these gigantic logical mistakes. She probably took high school chemistry in the first semester you learned that if you dissolve a little bit of CO2 in H2O, you get carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. She flunked out, though, and in the second semester she didn't learn that all natural systems have buffers, especially biological systems, and that's why she can make this uh, silly idea. Um, My understanding is that she got the degree from Harvard, so. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, when I give these talks, I did a calculation a few years ago, I'm not sure how accurate it is, that there's about a thousand times as much CO2 dissolved in the oceans as there is in the atmosphere. So if you dissolve all of the CO2 in the atmosphere in the ocean, it would be one part in a thousand, so it's not going to change the PO2. So the whole thing is absurd. 
And finally, I have what I would call the Maccabee soon paradox related to the Arnold uh, hypothesis or that um, 100 university faculty members can believe a silly idea that only a fool would accept. Right, I mean, it's a, yeah. I, I, I just respect a, a scientist like that, of course. I mean, he's a very good guy because uh, my friend know him personally and work with him. His achievement, of course, is beyond this world, to put it that way, I mean. The KAM theory is something, it's like a gift from God, I mean, to be so beautiful, anyway. Thank you, and I'll be around, of course. I have gotten vacation from my family, so I should be around here to chat with any of you. Thank you. <laughs>